Hey there, welcome to Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. Really excited about this one today, man. Um, this one is entitled, When Did They Finally Realize Who He Was? And of course, I'll start out with a story like I do most of the time. So here we go. Okay, so there was a movie that I was watching a while ago when a cleaning lady was going about her job in a penthouse office of a major corporation and as she did her work, a young man came in and sat down at one of the desks. As she swept the carpet, the young man got out of his seat so she could get under his desk. She asked him how it was to be working for a grumpy old rich guy, and he just smiled. She continued to try to make small talk with him as he responded cordially and respectfully. Then she finally read the nameplate on his desk. What were the odds of this young man having the same name? as what was on the huge skyscraper she was working in. She looked at him and put two and two together and realized that she was in the presence of the owner and her employer. How embarrassed she must have been to know that she had displayed her ignorance to the boss. But he was more than welcoming in accepting her apologies. You know, there were times when Jesus was in the presence of those who didn't realize who he was too. His mercy and his grace for their not knowing was proven time and time again. That was until he realized that they said they believed, but their actions proved that they really didn't. Find out what his reactions were right here on this episode of Word on the Street with JP. Don't you touch that dial because I'll be right back. Hey there, welcome yet to another episode of Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. Really excited about this one. Usually wouldn't stay up this late or early, you know, working on a recording. But I felt that the need to get it out was like really important. So, you know, many people say that they know who Jesus is, but their actions don't line up with what their mouths say. There were many times in the Bible where Jesus got frustrated at the unbelief of the people, especially those who were closest to him. And even though he performed miracles, healings, and even raised some folks from the dead, even those closest to him really didn't get who he was until his resurrection. And knowing this, we can clearly see why the heart of God was broken. Having seen all that Jesus did and stood for still wasn't enough to convince the people that Jesus was truly who he said he was. So he was often upset with his followers, but it wasn't always that way. In the beginning, they believed and were excited to know that they were potentially in the presence of the long-awaited Messiah, as stated in John, the second chapter, the 11th verse, where it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So Jesus began his ministry and brought his new disciples with him. Their willingness to put aside their families, their lives, their professions, and all other things that they had going on to follow him was a testament of their faith in who they believed him to be. With this being the case, somewhere along the way, they stopped believing. And why? You know, their inconsistent faith was often a source of heartbreak for Jesus and disappointment as he displays his displeasure with them in the following scripture. It's found in Matthew, the 21st chapter, the 12th verse. So first we'll talk about his disruption in the temple and how he got mad 
at the things that were going on there. And it reads starting out in verse 12, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Verse 13, and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. He went in and went ham when he saw that things were out of order in his house or his father's house. And just like the Lord stood against evil, we're supposed to do the same. The amazing thing about this text is that even after his holy indignation was satisfied, many were offended as he defended the temple and the intentions that God had for his house. Some were convinced of his godship so much that they came to him anyway, even after this great disruption, as if they would come to God to get their petitions answered. And Jesus, because he is God, he went back to doing the love thing as he immediately took care of those who needed him. Some knew him to be God manifested in the flesh and some just flat out got offended. But God wrote that in this love letter called the Bible and he exposed the compromise of those who are only in this for gain as this serves as an example of how those in the body of Christ are encouraged to conduct themselves when defending the things of God, knowing that Jesus is God. And now we'll get into how upset Jesus got at the religious leadership of the day in the 21st chapter, the 23rd verse. And it says, starting in verse 23, and when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority dost thou do these things? And who gave thee this authority? Verse 24, and Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not believe in then? Verse 26, but if we say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. Verse 27, And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. So he's basically saying, If you can't answer my question, I'm not going to answer yours. Holy indignation. He was straight, abrupt, and rude with them. And that offended them because they didn't know who he was. And now the enemy was another story. The devil knew Jesus and exactly who he was. He was the only one who was certain of the identity of the Lord. But he wanted to know if Jesus knew who he was. And the scripture reads as follows in Matthew, the first chapter, the first through the 11th verse, where it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 2, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. Verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In verse 5 it says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Verse 6, And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they will bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, And the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Verse 9, And said unto him, All these will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him alone shalt thou worship. Verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So the devil knew who he was. The angels knew who he was. And more importantly, he knew who he was. So now that we've given three examples of unbelief and two confirming who Jesus was, let's get a little deeper into it. 
There are three examples out of the four justified the holy indignation that Jesus displayed in the text. His disdain for how God and the temple were dishonored justified his anger. And the fact that those who are supposed to be leading the people into godliness were taking advantage of the people and the temple for personal gain was another. The beginning of the faith for his followers must have been refreshing for him. But as time went on and he realized that the more miracles, signs and wonders that he performed in their sight, somewhere along the line, this became not enough for them to keep their faith in him in play, thus letting him know that they really either didn't believe he was who he said he was, or they were getting too comfortable in his humanness. Either way, it upset him very much that they still didn't get it. And the last example in scripture that drives this point home is found in Matthew, the eighth chapter, the 18th through the 27th verse where it reads, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. Verse 19, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Verse 20, And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Verse 21, And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Verse 22, But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. Verse 23, it says, And when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. Verse 24, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Verse 25, And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Verse 26, And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Verse 27, But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Here we go. They still don't believe. Well, they have to ask the question, Who is he that he can do these things? He told them that he was the Son of God. And what I marveled at in this text was that Jesus picked his disciples on how they would in the future believe in him rather than if they believed in him while they were yet with them. If we look carefully, we can clearly see the source of Jesus' frustration as Jesus first gave them a command that they would go to the other side. They should have taken that as a promise that they would make it to the other side, but they didn't. Instead, they let their faith in him fail once again and begin begging for help. He had already provided by telling them, come, let us go to the other side. If they weren't going to make it, he wouldn't have told them to go. Then there was the scribe that offered to follow him, but Jesus pretty much told him that he didn't have the right stuff to be a follower because he would soon get uncomfortable with the accommodations or lack thereof, and that this would wind up being a problem for the old scribe. So Jesus basically told him, all right, but just know that Following me won't be a walk in the park like you're used to. Then there was another who offered to come along with him, but made excuses of what business he had need to take care of before he would commit. And Jesus basically told this guy, if you're not willing to stop, drop and roll for me, then there's no room for you on this journey. But then we see in the very next verse that those who had what it took didn't say a word, but just came along with the ride. As it says that as soon as he got on the boat, so did his disciples. The ones he handpicked automatically did what he called them to do. No questions asked. The ones who would eventually prove to be faithful and consequently instrumental to taking this gospel throughout the whole world at the expense of their own lives. They just got on board. And even though Jesus was God manifested in the flesh, his human side still got frustrated with them during those moments when they demonstrated their unbelief in who he was and right in his face. At least they were honest though, you know, and transparent. And maybe that's why he picked them. And having broken down these moments when people operated in doubt and unbelief in the very presence of God, who do we say Jesus is to us? Are we like the bougie scribe? Are we like the one who thinks they need to get some things together in their lives before they fully commit to Jesus? 
Or are we one of the ones who only believes if we see it? Or are we like the disciples who just got in the boat? No questions asked. Thank God that Jesus quenched the anger of God for us. That he doesn't have to continue in his frustration towards us. Because Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross for all those who would believe in and on him. Take it away and quenching the anger, the wrath of God. Thank God that he no longer is angry with us. As the finished works of Jesus at Calvary covers us with his blood, making us partakers in his mercy and his grace. And just like the disciples, he knows what we will be as the work he began in us, he is sure to finish. Because of that, he entreats us in our appointments as heirs with Jesus throughout eternity. And because of the blood that was shed for us, we are all sealed in him and are legal recipients of the promises that he made to our fathers in the faith. So if you don't know Jesus in the pardoning of your sins and you want to, or you simply want to rededicate your lives and your efforts back to God, now's the time to get that thing done. Hey there, and thank you so much for listening and watching Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and if you don't know Jesus in the pardoning of your sins and you want to, simply believe that God the Father sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to the cross to pay the sin debt that you owed. He died, was buried, resurrected on the third day, and rose with all power. Ask God the Father to forgive you of your sins. Confess those sins that he might throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. Believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God. Give your life to him. Ask him into your life that you might be his and he might be your God. And then congratulations is in order as you are one of the newest members of the family of faith. So welcome to the family. Make sure that you connect yourself with a Bible-based ministry, one that rightly divides the word of God. Learn about the things of God. Get to work serving God by serving people. Thank you so much for listening, watching We're on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. Make sure that you pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. And if I don't see you again on this side, I'll see you again on the other side. But until then, that's right. Maybe we'll just see you on the radio. Shalom.